uh, because once I get wound up, I lose track of the time. So we got a lot to cover tonight, and uh, I want us to go ahead on and get started. Pastor Stacy, you can go to the first slide. Um, I think that we have sufficiently covered the first four reasons uh, concerning our reasons for becoming offended. As I've been saying over the past few weeks, that Jesus says that it's impossible to live this life and, and not be offended. And yet then Jesus comes back and tells us that even though we will be offended, it's important to work against not only being offended, to guard against being offended, but to also guard against offending others. Jesus said, woe to those who offend, and not only woe to those who offend, but also to those who offend others. So the question that we have to ask ourselves is, you know, if it's impossible to go through life without being offended, what are some of the things that contribute to offense? And we've been talking about those items. I've been going over those for the past few weeks. The first one was overreacting to minor issues. I'm not going to go over each one of them because as I mentioned these lessons are uh, uploaded to our YouTube channel. So you can go back and review the lessons, get the notes, et cetera. Um, second reason is misinterpretation of intentions. Sometimes we interpret intentions to be malicious when they're not. And so it's important for us to sometimes give folks the benefit of the doubt when we are uh, questioning or thinking that they intend to offend us. Sometimes they do, but we don't want our default to always be that we are misinterpreting intentions. And then the third one was difficulty in handling agreements that because we all come from various backgrounds, we have various experiences, we are wired differently. Uh, there are going to be times that we don't always agree with one another. And sometimes we may feel strongly about uh, a particular subject or a particular thing, but we must also recognize that there is a place for agree, agreeing to, to disagree and learning to have healthy discussion, healthy disagreement, maybe even at times intense discussion without relationships suffering because we don't always see eye to eye. And last week we talked about uh, the need for validation as being another reason why people sometimes get offended. For those persons that require, uh, that, that require excessive external validation, that it can place a strain and make your relationships rather difficult. Rather difficult. It, it can even create conflict in, in relationships. Tonight, I want to talk about the next reason, which is the tendency to blame others. The tendency to blame others. And I'll begin by saying that taking responsibility is the willingness to give an account for our actions. Taking responsibility is the willingness to give an account for our actions. It's being willing to, to bear the burden of what we have done or what we have not done. In summary, it is being willing to answer for our conduct and our obligations. Somebody might want to type that in the chat. It's being willing to be answerable for our conduct and our obligation. We are watching the former chief executive on a trial, running for president and run on, a, on trial on public television, mainly because he doesn't really want to take responsibility for his actions or his conduct. And basically is saying to us that he has a right to be a criminal, does not respect the rule of law, uh, has no problem with being, I won't say he breaks the law, but he's so unethical that he comes close to breaking it. Uh, he's immoral in many ways. And in some instances, 
we know that he has broken the law, but he's unwilling to be answerable for his conduct and his actions. The tendency to blame others is being unwilling to be held accountable, to be answerable to our actions. It means we must be willing to take responsibility. It is willing to give an account of our actions. It is a willingness to bear the burden of what we have done. You can go to the next slide, Pastor Stacy. However, the truth is human nature often leads us to refuse to take responsibility for our actions. Anybody know anybody like that? Human nature can lead us to refuse to take responsibility for our actions. In fact, when we are confronted with our mistakes, we will often play the blame game and attempt to deflect our responsibility onto someone else. Now we know we've seen children do it, but children are not the only ones that do it. We see it happening in the workplace. We call it throwing folk under the bus. That's really what we call it. But it's also the tendency to blame others. When we don't want to be accountable or responsible for our behavior, for our conduct and our actions, human nature will lead us to refuse to take responsibility for our actions. So somebody type in the chat, all of us do it at some time or another. All of us have been guilty of trying to throw somebody under the bus. We, we, at some point, it has been very important to all of us, I believe, at some point in our lives to deflect responsibility onto someone else because it's difficult to be held accountable for our actions. But hum because human nature leads us to refuse to take responsibility for our actions. You can go to the next slide, Pastor Stacy. In his book, somebody said, I have done it. <laughs> In his book, Spiritual Maturity, Dr. Frank Thomas calls this the sin of playing the victim. He has a book called Spiritual Maturity, Preserving Congregational Health and Balance. It's a great book. But in that book, there's a chapter in that book where Dr. Thomas talks about, calls the tendency to blame others, the sin of playing the victim. And he elaborates on the story in Genesis chapter three, verse one through 13. Go to Genesis chapter three right quick. Genesis chapter three, because you need to have a context for what Dr. Thomas is asserting in his book. One of the things he says that for much of interpretive biblical history, Bible scholars have primarily focused on Adam and Eve's sinful act of disobedience in eating what they were commanded not to eat, recorded okay. in Genesis chapter three. We know that in Genesis chapter three, uh, God says to them, you may eat from any tree in the garden except from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, because in the day that you eat it, you will surely die, right? We know that story. Thomas believes, however, that these passages also clearly illustrate what may be considered to be the companion of original sin. Dr. Thomas asserts that a companion to the uh, to the of a to original sin is the sin of playing the victim. Can I say that again? He argues that the companion to original sin is the sin of playing the victim. That original sin and the sin of playing the victim, there's no ranking. It's not like one is over the other. Dr. Thomas is arguing that they are companions. That is just as bad that original sin, or I should say that the sin of playing the victim is just as bad as original sin itself. And what he argues, you can go to the next slide, is that following the sin of disobedience, the most appealing, the most prevalent, and the most frequently, and I like this phrase that he used, non-resisted temptation. Non-resisted temptation 
is to play the role of the victim. In other words, he's saying that the thing that's most appealing to humanity, most prevalent and most frequently non-resistant, non-resisted is the temptation to play the role of victim. As I said earlier, we all guilty of it. Why? Because to be quite honest, pride does not like to let us admit when we are wrong. Pride keeps us from acknowledging when we have done something that uh, falls beneath God's standard. Pride is what keeps us from admitting or taking responsibility for our actions because we we really don't want to we really don't want to look like we're human. But because we are human, we are prone to make mistakes. We're prone to fall short of the glory of God. We're prone to um, do things that are beneath the God's glorious standard. But in reality, human nature keeps us from, from taking responsibility for that. And so what Dr. Thomas argues is that the sin of playing the victim is the most appealing, most prevalent, and most frequently the non-resisted temptation. That we don't even put up any resistance when it comes to, to uh, blaming people or throwing other folk under the bus. Because we don't want anything to mar our image. We don't want to look like we are not perfect. We don't want to look like we make mistakes when all of us, all of us are human beings and all of us are capable of making mistakes, falling short of the glory of God, doing something that um, requires correction or requires feedback. He says, you can go to the next slide. This is Dr. Thomas still talking. He says that the original sin was not simply the act of disobedience. This is why he compares the, he makes the, the original sin and the sin of playing the victim. This is why Dr. Thomas views them as companions. He says that the original sin was not simply the act of disobedience. That was enough. But the unwillingness of Adam to take responsibility when God confronted him about his behavior. So here we have the sin of disobedience. If you all, y'all looking at Genesis chapter three, y'all looking at Genesis chapter three. When we, when, when, when God comes in the cool of the evening and wants to know where they are, because once they eat the fruit, and may I just say as a caveat, it was not an apple. The Bible doesn't say it was an apple. Some kind of way an apple got into the uh, images and paintings, but the Bible doesn't tell us what type of fruit it was. Once the fruit was eaten and God appears, well, before God appears with the voice of God, comes to them in the garden, uh, they put fig leaves on themselves to cover their nakedness because the Bible says that once they ate, from the fruit, their eyes were open and they were naked and unashamed. But because they were not, they now could see differently, they sewed fig leaves together to cover their nakedness. And when God shows up and God wants to know why God is calling to account, because God is saying, I know what I told you. I know the instructions I gave you. So how did this happen? How did we, how did we end? How did we get here? <laughs> is what God is asking. How did we get here? How did we get here, Adam? Because why does God speak to Adam? Because the instructions were given to Adam. They weren't given to Eve. But what Adam does, Adam is not willing, Dr. Thomas says, to take responsibility for his relationship with God and the choices and the decisions and the actions that flowed from their relationship. You can go to the next slide, Pastor Stacy. Thomas argues that instead, Adam and Eve, now we know Eve gets blamed all the time, but the truth of the matter is they are companions in disobedience. Both of them disobeyed. Adam disobeyed and Eve did too. Instead, Thomas argues he and Eve, Adam and Eve, 
established a disobedience and victim pattern that is basic and fundamental to human nature, reverberating through the ages of human history in various forms and disguises. In other words, what Thomas is arguing is that as a result of their failure to take responsibility, they established a pattern that is basic and fundamental to human nature. In other words, what he's saying is one of the reasons why it's so hard for us to take responsibility is because Eve and Adam established the pattern back in the garden. And it has reverberated through the ages of human history in various forms and disguises. Let me pause for a second and let's go to Genesis chapter three. Who has Genesis chapter three? Anybody? Anybody at Genesis chapter three? If you're at Genesis chapter three, unmute your I mind. have a pastor. Okay. So this is Faye. Okay, Deacon Faye. Let's go to um let's go to verse six. Let's go to verse six and read until I tell you to stop. Okay. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Uh -huh. Then the eyes of both of them were open and they realized they were naked. Uh -huh. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Okay, then stop right there. Stop right there, Faith, for just a second. Let's mm -hmm. go back to verse one, because one of the things I do want to mention, if you recall, we were talking about the strategies and schemes of the adversary of the devil who represents the personification of evil for us in the Bible, because we believe that evil is not just somewhere up there. Evil is out here everywhere. Notice, remember one of the, one of the strategies that I mentioned to you are tactics, if you will, or uh, schemes that the enemy uses against us is deception. Somebody type that in the chat, deception. The eating of the forbidden fruit resulted because of deception, because Eve, because the serpent told a lie. Remember I told you that deception is one of the strategies, one of the lies that the adversary uses against us. And if he can get convince us that a lie is the truth, he has won the victory over us. Go to verse one right quick, Faye, before we go back to that. Go to verse okay. one and okay. read until I tell you to stop. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? So notice, notice, notice this. Listen, did God really say that you... Already he's doing what? Causing Eve to rethink and question what God is talking. Did God really say that you couldn't eat from any tree in the garden? She knows what God has said. First of all, God didn't tell her. God told Adam. But the 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 using confusion, right? Somebody type confuse her, trying to confuse her and deceive her at the same time. Go ahead, keep reading, keep reading. The, the woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die. So notice Eve was clear about the instructions. Eve said, not only should we not eat it, we're not even supposed to touch it. Because if we eat it and touch it or touch it, we will surely die. Go ahead to verse four. You will not surely die. A line wonder. Type in the chat. The a line wonder. Type in the chat. The devil is a line wonder. Keep, keep reading for faith. <laughs> Go ahead. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Okay, and then you already read chapter verse six through through seven. Uh, seven. Okay, pick up at verse eight. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Mm -hmm. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But 
The Lord God called to the man, where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. So the, yeah. here's the first, here's the first blame. Notice that God talks to Adam first and Adam does what? Blames Eve. All mm -hmm. right. Keep reading. Go ahead. We still then talking the, about the sin of blaming the victim that uh, the sin of playing the victim that Dr. Thomas is talking about in his book. Keep reading. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. Okay, you can stop right there. So you see what happened. Eve, Adam blamed Eve and Eve blames the serpent. Mm -hmm. Here, Dr. Thomas is saying, this is where that victim disobedience and victim pattern that is basic and fundamental to human nature that reverberates throughout the ages in various forms and disguises began. This this is where being thrown under the bus. This is the origin of being thrown under the bus. He tried to blame Eve by intimating that Eve gave him the fruit and he unsuspectingly ate the fruit. In other words, because he did not know what he was doing, he was not really guilty of anything. Then he attempted to blame God by saying, the woman you gave me, the woman you put in the garden with, with me. And if you hadn't put her in the garden with me, then we wouldn't be in this trouble. <laughs> so what Thomas argues, go to the next slide, is that Adam's response is indicative of his belief that he was not a mature moral agent. Somebody type that in the chat. Mature moral agent that could make choices to either hinder or help his life. Dr. Thomas argues that Adam's response is indicative of his belief that he was not a mature moral agent. In other words, that if he, he does not want to take responsibility, he simply wants to blame somebody. But when you are a mature moral agent, you have the capacity we have the capacity to make our own decisions. Now, does that mean other people won't try to influence us? No, it does not. Does that mean that the pressure won't be intense? Does that mean that there won't be people who will come along and try to convince us to do something that is outside of the God of God's will for our lives? No, it does not. However, as a mature moral agent, which is what we are striving to become, or we should already be as disciples of Jesus Christ, we have the capacity to make our own decisions. Even when the serpent was trying to convince Eve that nothing would happen, she had the capacity to make a decision. But what did she do? She listened to the serpent and ate the fruit. And then after listening to the serpent, Adam ate it as well. Dr. Thomas argues that this response that Adam gave is indicative of his belief that he was not a mature moral agent. Why? Because what he's basically saying is, well, it's really your fault, God. Because if you hadn't given me this woman, she never would have been talking to the snake. And, and, and the snake never would have convinced her. And then I never would have eaten. But at the end of the day, nobody shoved the fruit down either one of them's throat. They made a decision to do it. And they are not the only ones. They are not the only ones in life or in scripture to do it. I'm going to give you a minute to type in the chat. Can you think of other examples? <laughs> Peaches said, I'm hollering. Why are you hollering, Peaches? Can you think of other examples in scripture where folks have thrown other folk under the bus? Anybody? Just type in the chat. 
Can you think of any, and, and, and now you see, as you are thinking about examples, now you see where throwing folk under the bus comes from. Now you see why it's really easy, easier than we would think for us to almost by default deflect responsibility for our actions on somebody else. Somebody said Joseph's brothers threw him under the bus. Anybody else? Anybody else? There's one story that's that's very, very prevalent in the scriptures. You all remember the golden calf story? When the folks were at the foot of the mountain and they got tired of waiting on Moses while he was waiting to receive the commandments of God. And when they, when Moses saw them throwing a party at the foot of, at the foot of the mountain, because Moses stayed so long, they end up making, taking their jewelry and making a golden calf. And then when Moses came down from the mountain and confronted Aaron, Aaron refused to take responsibility. Somebody look at chapter 32 in Exodus verse 22. I want you to see another example of somebody. Aaron threw the whole nation under the bus. Now, he was the one that was left in charge. But when it was time for him to give an account of his actions, he was unwilling to take responsibility for what he had done. Somebody, somebody, does somebody have uh, Exodus chapter 32, verse 32? I'm sorry, not verse 32, verse 22. Does someone have Exodus chapter 32, verse 22? I have it. Yeah, Saul was another one. You, you can go ahead, uh, Pastor Kanita. Do not be angry, my Lord, Aaron answered. You know how prone these people are to evil. Listen, it, listen, listen, <laughs> listen to what he's saying. Throwing them completely under the bus. Yeah. Now, they did convince him. But again, Aaron was a what? Mature moral agent. Type this in the chat. No, don't let anybody talk you into doing something you know you're not supposed to do. Or don't let them talk you out of not doing something that you know you ought to do. And then if we do it, don't throw them under the bus. Just take responsibility. Aaron knew what his responsibility was. He was a, a mature moral. He was Moses' assistant. So he was just as guilty of becoming impatient as the people who were at the foot of the mountain. Go ahead. I'm sorry, Pastor, Pastor Kanita. They said, to said me, don't be a follower. <laughs> they said to me, make us gods who will go before us. As for the fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. So I told them, whoever has any gold jewelry, take it off. Then they gave me the jewelry and I threw it into the fire and out came this calf. Listen, and out came a calf. Right. Lying, just lying. So type this in the chat. At least we're not the only ones. <laughs> Aaron did it before we did it. Adam and Eve did it before we did it. Saul did it before we did it. We are not the only ones. So you know what that ought to do? It ought to free us up to take ownership. When we blow, when we blow it, when we make a mistake, we just need to own, take responsibility for our action in whatever setting we're in. On our job, how many times have we either, either work with people that throw us under the bus or, excuse me, work with people that we have thrown under the bus in our social circle, in ministry? You know, it's better to just take responsibility. Why don't we want to take responsibility? We don't want, we don't want, we don't want the price. We don't want the, we don't want to pay the price. We don't want the embarrassment. We don't want the response. Sometimes we don't want the penalty because we know that taking responsibility sometimes may also have some kind of penalty or reprimand or correction attached to it. But somebody typed in the chat a few minutes ago, just take responsibility for what we have done. Somebody type in the chat, Lord, help me. 
Lord, help me. Help me to take responsibility. Somebody said, we don't want that smoke. That's right. We don't want that smoke. We don't want the smoke that comes with taking responsibility for our behavior, for our actions, or even some of the ways that we think. But at the end of the day, what Dr. Thomas is arguing is that when we fail to do that, the sin of playing the victim is just as bad as original sin. This is what Dr. Thomas is arguing, that they are not ranking that there is no ranking, that they are companion sins, that the disobedience that resulted in the eating of the forbidden fruit was just as bad as the sin of blaming one another to get out of taking responsibility for their actions. So what is the antidote then? What is the remedy for blaming? What can we do so that we can take ownership. What, what can we do? How, what, what is the, the antidote or the remedy? Or what is a, I shouldn't say the, what is a remedy for blaming? Here's what I want to offer tonight. And the remedy that I want to offer is confession. Somebody said, tell the truth. That's right. Tell the truth. It's just as simple. It's not rocket science. Tell the truth. Now, the truth of the matter is truth can get you in trouble. Truth can be inconvenient. You can go to the next slide, Pastor Stacy. The remedy that I want to offer is confession. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. The sin of blaming the victim attempts to shift the blame and responsibility outside of oneself. And then let me let me just add this too. It's not just it's not just the sin of shifting responsibility outside of oneself. It's also the sin of shifting responsibility onto outside of oneself onto someone who may be innocent, who, who really didn't have anything to do with the mess we created or the mistake that we made. So not only is it a sin of blaming, but sometimes we're shifting responsibility to, onto others who had nothing to do with the mistake or uh, the mistake that we made or whatever sin, if you will, we may have committed. You, you can go to the next slide. You can go to the next slide. We've I've already talked about that. So I'm, I'm suggesting, I'm offering that confession is a powerful tool. Somebody said, just tell the truth. Confession is a powerful tool for taking responsibility for our actions. Type that in the chat, confession. Confession. When we confess, you can go to the next slide, Pastor Stacy. We acknowledge our mistakes. We oh, stay right there. When we confess, confession is a powerful tool for taking responsibility for our actions. It is also the first step toward responsibility and accountability. Type that in the chat. Confession is the first step toward responsibility and accountability, especially when I'm tempted to play the sin of this, when I'm tempted to um, play the sin of being the victim. It is the first step toward responsibility and accountability. Confession can be a powerful tool for taking responsibility for our actions. You can go to the next slide, Pastor Stacy. When we confess, we acknowledge our mistakes, our wrongdoings, which is the first step towards accountability. It shows that we are willing to face the consequences of our actions and make amends. And you know what else it shows? That we are human. The psalmist says, because he knows our frame, he remembers that we are dust. Somebody type in the chat, it shows that we are made of dust. It is our acknowledgement that we are not perfect, that we are human beings, that we are capable of making mistakes, that we are capable of falling short of the glory of God, that we are capable of doing the wrong thing many times unintentionally. But even if we did it intentionally, we still, it still uh, 
is the first step toward accountability. And it demonstrates that we're willing to face the consequences of our actions and make amends. How many of you remember getting in trouble because in your group of friends, when you did something, nobody wanted to say they did it? I will never forget, we got a whipping when we were children. I think we got a whipping or you got in trouble. I don't even remember. But my grandmother had baked, baked all these sweet potato pies. And you know how you would run in and out of the house when you were children. You'd run in and run outside and run in and run. Well, somebody in the group of my friends decided that they would stick their fingers in the potato pie. Well, you know money was ready to kill all of us. She hit the ceiling. And, and nobody would take the blame for what they had done. Everybody sitting in there. The pie, the pie, yeah, the, 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 the sweet potato pie with the dark brown crust. Yes, somebody decided that they would put their fingers in the pie. I cannot tell you how long we sat there on trial, waiting on somebody to testify, and nobody ever testified. Nobody ever admitted. Well, we all got punished. This is what I'm talking about. When I say when we are not willing to face the consequences of our actions, and we now that's an exact well, it's not an exaggerated example, but that's a simple example of what I'm talking about. The things that can happen when we either throw people under the bus or we're under, everybody got punished. Everybody, because no, nobody knew, nobody, nobody. And I really didn't know somebody had stuck their fingers in the pie because we would run in the house to wash our hands and go back outside to play. Well, somebody decided that on their way out the kitchen, they would stick their hands in the potato. Maria was livid. When I say she was livid, because she had baked all these pies, you know, she used to cook for other folk. So she had baked five or six sweet potato pies. They were all lined up on the table. And one of my little grubby hand friends decided that they would stick their fingers in the pie. Mass incarceration. Somebody said mass incarceration. Right. <laughs> Nobody, nobody wanted to face the consequences of their actions and make amends. Why? Because they knew they were going to get in trouble. They knew that they, they knew that their mama was going to tear them up. They knew that they would probably go to bed without eating. <laughs> they knew that there would be consequences. And what is it that causes us to um, try to shift? responsibility because we don't want to face consequences type that in the chat we don't want to face consequences right <laughs> dr angela said we needed hush money look like somebody paid some hush money because i still don't know to this day who stuck their fingers in that pie because nobody spoke up nobody did but we all got in trouble we all got in trouble why because somebody was not willing to face the consequences of their actions and make amends. Now they, they for certain, they couldn't bake some more pies, but they didn't even want to face the consequences because they knew what the consequences would be. They knew that Maria would go and tell their mother and the mother would probably make them come inside, grab them up in the collar. They, they probably end up getting the whip. We don't want to face consequences. Take that in the chat. Nobody really wants to face consequences, especially when the consequences are going to be negative. We don't mind positive consequences, but we don't want negative consequences. Nobody wants negative consequences. Pastor Kanita says we will not tell the truth to the point that we will let other people take the blame and get in trouble for us. And that is true. There are many people behind bars today because somebody didn't want to take the blame. Somebody didn't want to take on up to the consequences. And there are people that are afraid to tell because of the consequences of telling. You know, I ain't no snitch. How many times have we heard folks say, I ain't no snitch. And you have people doing wrongdoing, but not, they're willing to do wrong, but they're not willing to take consequence, to, to pay the consequences. Now, we're not talking about folk on this call doing anything that would cause us to do prison time, but I'm just using examples to show us of how um, the larger 
what the larger and far-reaching implications can be when we are unwilling to face the consequences of our actions and unwilling to make amends. But when we confess our wrongdoing, when we acknowledge our mistakes, it is the first step towards accountability. <laughs> Jimmy said, I'd still be investigating that case. <laughs> I'm telling you, we all got in trouble about those sweet potato pies. All of us got in trouble. I mean, they had stuck all of their 10 fingers in the pie. Not just a finger. I mean, they like they were playing a keyboard. They had stuck their fingers down in the pie like that. And, and we sat there in that kitchen for the longest. It seemed like eternity. And nobody said a mumbling word. And Muddy was livid. Go to the next slide. <laughs> Thanks, Pastor Stacy. Ultimately, confession can contribute to our personal growth and the strengthening of relationships. Here's the other thing. It fosters honesty and transparency. What is the benefit of confession? It can contribute to our personal growth. It strengthens relationships and it fosters honesty and transparency and it helps us to live with more authenticity. It can also be therapeutic because it helps us to release feelings of guilt or shame that may be weighing us down. When I, I went to a Catholic school, part of my time, and one of the things that they used to have in the Catholic school was something called confession. And I never forget the times that we went to confession and, you know, in those days at the, at the school, you didn't go into the little box like they have at the Catholic churches. You know, if you go to the Catholic church, if you go in a Catholic uh, church, they have this little sort of like a little closet that you walk into and you walk in there and you make the sign across the name of Father, Son, the Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit. Forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. And, you know, the priest listens to you make confession for the things that you have done. And then they ask you to do penance or whatever. And then they absolve you of your, of your sins. Um, we didn't do confession in that regard, but we would go and talk to the priest about various things that we had done. And there was, there was a lifting. There was a, we, we, well, I, I, I can only speak for myself. Um, I felt after I left those those times that we spent with the priest, there was something therapeutic about just laying all that stuff down and not carrying it and having a safe space, a safe space to make confession, to take responsibility. James 5 says, confess your faults to another and be healed. Go to the next slide, Pastor Stacey. Confess your faults, confess your sins. Somebody go to James chapter five, verse 16 through 17. We read in James chapter five, this, that verse that says, um, the effectual fervent prayers of the righteous availeth much. But in that same pericope is this verse that tells us to confess our sins, our faults to each other and pray for each other so that we may be healed. Now, what James is suggesting is that our healing is also tied to our confession. Woo, I feel a tongue coming right here. That healing is tied to confession. Not, maybe not just physical healing, but emotional healing. That there is a type of healing that is connected to confess somebody does somebody have james chapter 5 16 through 17 somebody find that somebody type that in the chat healing is tied to confession healing is connected to confession and what we do sometimes you know we just pull that verse out that says the effectual pr fervent prayer of the righteous availeth much but if we look at it in context Somebody type in context. If we look at it in context, we find that there is that confession is connected to healing. All right. Anybody got it? Somebody got it? Un unmute and read it for me. Stop. Deborah, you have it. Deborah, I got it. it. I do, Pastor. Okay. Deborah, start at verse 13 instead of verse 15. Okay. 
Is any one of you in trouble? He should pray. Is anyone happy? Let him sing songs of praise. Is any one of you sick? He should call the elders of the church to pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. My, my, my. And the prayer offered in faith uh -huh. will make the sick person well. Uh -huh. The Lord will raise him up. If he has sinned, he will be forgiven. He really Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Okay. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. So if we look at this in context, what James is actually saying is that while the prayer of the righteous is effective, is, is effective, that confession precedes the healing. Notice what it says. Therefore, after he's talked about the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well and the Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, notice they, he doesn't make the assumption that you've sinned, that we've sinned. But he does say, if we have sinned, if we have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. So here's what we need. We need some safe spaces where we can tell the truth. Type that in the chat. Lord, give me a safe space for truth telling. Give me a safe space so I, where I can confess my sin to somebody that won't put it on the wings of the morning. Give me a safe space <clears throat> where I can confess my sins where I won't see it on Facebook the next day or within the next two hours. Give me a safe space where we can confess one to another and pray for one another. So what does that mean? You don't confess to just anybody though. Now I'm just going to say that as a caveat. Make sure that if you confess to somebody, you confess to somebody that's trustworthy. You're confessing to someone that, that is safe. You're confessing to someone that will will honor your confidentiality. I don't like to use the word secrets because secrets can be deadly, but will honor your confidentiality. Therefore, confess your, you know why? Because when we carry guilt around in us, not only does it burden us down, but it weighs us down. Somebody go to Psalm 32, verse five. Psalm 32, verse five. This is the Psalm that David prayed after he had sinned with Bathsheba. Well, 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 before you do that, go to the next slide, Pastor Stacey, because I'm getting excited and I might be getting ahead of myself. Yeah, because it is no exaggeration to say that we have all sinned. Type that in the chat. All have sinned. All, capital all, A-L-L. -L, capital all, capital A-L-L. -L. It is no exaggeration to say that all of us have sinned. So that's the baseline. We have all sinned. We've all fallen short of God's glorious standard. Somebody go to Romans chapter three, verse 23. We are all in the same boat. None of us can say that we are sinless. We may be in a position where we try to sin less, but none of us are sinless. All of us fall short of God, I left a word off, of God's glorious standard. That's the New Living Translation, Romans 3 and 23. Do you all highlight these verses? I'll let y'all highlight these verses. For every, everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. I think that's the word I left off. I apologize. Romans chapter 3, verse 23. It's no exaggeration to say that we have sinned. We all sin. We all will sin. We all have sin and we're going to sin again because none of us are perfect. We are saved from the penalty of sin, but we are not saved from the completely saved from the power of sin. The power of seduction that pulls us away from doing the will of God. 
from doing the very thing that we said we would not do, the very thing that God tells us not to do, the seduction of disobedience, the seduction of following after our own way, the seduction of walking according to the course of this world. All of us have sinned and fall short, fallen short of God's glorious standard. And at its core, sin damages our relationship with God. It damages our relationship with others. It damages our relationship with ourselves. But with good confession, with good confession, somebody type good confession, the damage can be repaired by God's infinite love and forgiveness. Because God, I said this last week, delights in mercy. God delights in mercy. God delights in forgiveness. People may not forgive us. People may be slow to forgive. They may be slow to give us another chance. They may be slow to love us unconditionally. But God delights in mercy. And what opens the door to God's love and God's forgiveness is not lying. Lying does not open the door to love and forgiveness. <clears throat> Denial, D-E-I-N-A-L, does not open the door to God's love and forgiveness. Blaming other folk, throwing other people under the bus, does not open the door to God's love and forgiveness. Can I tell you what opens the door? Somebody said, Pastor, tell us plainly. Type in the chat, Pastor, tell us, please tell us. Confession. Confession. Confession opens the door to God's forgiveness. Confession opens the door to God's unconditional love. Confession opens the door, not just to God's uh, unconditional love, but God's infinite love, love that has no bounds, love that does not have a quota. I'm glad that God's love doesn't have a quota because if it did, I would have already exhausted the quota. God's love for us is infinite, and unconditional. Type that in the chat. God's love for me is infinite and unconditional, which means that no matter how many times I sin, no matter how many times I fall short of the glory of God, God keeps giving me another chance. But I got to confess. And too often in the body of Christ, because we have not really embraced confession as a spiritual discipline, we don't even receive the grace that we need to keep moving forward. We don't receive the grace that we need to resist the sin the next time. We don't receive the grace that we need to learn the humility that is necessary to confess our mistakes and better prepare us to receive the Lord's Supper. Now, that's a whole nother conversation. So it is a discipline. This is where we can take a page from the Catholics, from the Catholics, from Catholicism, because confession is one of the seven sacraments of the Catholic Church. Many believe, however, in Protestant denominations, which is what we are, we are Protestants, that the discipline of confession, confession is more of a Catholic doctrine and by default believe that Protestants do not really believe in confession. We don't really even have a place in our liturgy for confession. And I've been thinking about this uh, as we, uh, as I've been working on this lesson. I was like, Lord, you know, we really don't have a place because we're not high, we're not high liturgy. Your Episcopal churches, your Catholic churches, your Lutheran churches, in their books of order, they have a space for confession in their liturgy. We don't really have a space for confession in our liturgy. Now we have a space for it during Ash Wednesday, but we have not made space for it in our liturgy as Protestants because primarily we don't think we need to confess our sins to a priest because we believe that we have direct access and we do. This is a doctrinal issue. There is a difference between what's biblical and what's doctrinal. Doct doctrinally, Protestants, Baptists, AMEs, you know, 
Church of God in Christ. We believe in direct access. For us as Baptists, we believe that we have direct access to God because we believe in the priesthood of believers. Go to the next slide. It's 732. Will y'all let me finish telling y'all about the priesthood of believers and then I'll stop. The priesthood of believers is what Protestants believe in. We, we ascribe to the priesthood of believers, which means we have direct access to God. I'm still talking about confession. So we believe that we don't need to go to a priest to confess. Thank God the veil in the temple has been torn in half. We have direct access to God. That means that through Christ, we have been given direct access to God just like a priest. This is why 1 Peter chapter 2, I believe, verse 9 says we are a holy priesthood. That technically we can go to God for ourselves just like the priest had to go to God in behalf of the people prior to the shedding of blood on Calvary. We believe doctrinally, we believe in the priesthood of believers, which means that God is equally accessible to every faithful Christian and that we all have the equal potential to minister to God. Go to Hebrews chapter four, look at this. Hebrews chapter four, verse 16, 14 through 16. You can go to the next slide. Therefore, since we have such a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then, Approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. So we believe that we have direct access. We believe in the priesthood of believers, and we don't necessarily believe that we need to go to anybody to receive forgiveness. That's good news. Because that means you can go to God for yourself. And if you can't confess to anybody else, the best place you can confess is to confess to God. James says, confess your sins to one another and be healed. But Hebrews 4 also tells us that we can come boldly. Woo, somebody type boldly. We can come boldly before the throne of grace with confidence that we might obtain mercy and find grace to help us in our time need. I'm going to stop right there because if I keep talking, I'm going to end up talking another 30 minutes and I don't want to do that because I don't want to rush. But I hope this is helping you tonight that confession, we said back in the day, confession is good for the soul. Type that in the chat. It's good for my soul. Confession is good for my soul because the more I can tell God the truth, the more I can tell the truth to other folk. The more I'm able to be truthful with God honest with God, tell the truth to God, the more authentically I can live my life. Many of us cannot live authentically. We cannot commit to truth telling because we have yet to take responsibility for our ownership for our actions and our behavior. But I promise you, I dare you to take it to God. I dare you to start telling God about it. I dare you. If you don't have a safe space, the safest space that you could have is in your prayer time. Here, this is bringing us right back to where we started back in September of last year when I was talking about prayer. I started out talking about prayer and that prayer is for more than just getting what we want from God. That if our only motive for praying is to get our wish list answered, we will not have much of a motivation for prayer. But we can go to God not only for intervention, not only for uh, intercession, uh, we can also go to God for confession. Type that in the chat. I can go to God for intervention. I can go to God for intercession, but I can also go to God for confession. Confession the old folk used to say, it's good for the soul. I added, it's good for the reputation too. Because here's the truth. Even when we don't want to take responsibility, folk know the truth. They know the truth. 
They know we guilty. They know we lying. <laughs> they know when we throwing other people under the bus. They just can. So it's, and when we are honest, when we are honest, when we tell the truth, when we take responsibility, people open their heart to us because people are generally compassionate. So even when we have made mistakes, when we, even when we have made mistakes, even when we have short, fallen short of the glory of God, we can go to God and make, not only make our requests known, but we can also tell God the truth. James says, confess your sins and be healed. Be healed of the burden. Be healed of the guilt. Be healed of the shame. Be healed of all of those things that weigh us down. Ooh, this is so good to me. I'm going to stop. Any questions? I'm going to stop because it's 730. I've already gone eight minutes over. It's 738. Any comments before we get off the call? Isn't this amazing? It's like it's like an onion. Every time I think we get to the end of something, we come. there's something else that, that comes along. And confession for the sin of playing the victim. Confession. Good for the soul. So if you don't have anybody, if you don't have a safe space, this is why my prayer life is so important. Because if I can't tell the truth to anybody else, I can tell the truth to God. So that I don't have to throw folks under the bus. That I don't have to play the sin of, of uh, playing the victim. The sin of playing the victim is Dr. Frank Anthony Thomas. Let me shut up. Any comments, questions? Let me be quiet because I'll keep talking. Any comments, questions? I'm not finished with this. I'll, I'll pick it up next week. But Any comments? Y'all burning this chat up. Y'all just looking at me, smiling. <laughs> no comments, no questions. Y'all, y'all meditating. <laughs> Pastor Glenda had a question. Um, speaking of prayer, how do we know when to stop praying for a desire? I don't know. I I guess I don't have a an answer to that. My my answer would be, uh, until you at peace, you know. And I and I'll use the example of um, myself. You know, one of the things I've always wanted is to be married, and here I am, sixty four, and and still not married. Um, but my desire is different now. Uh, you know, it used to be, Lord, if you don't let me get married, I don't know if I'm going to be able to make it. I'm, I, you know, I, I just felt like my life was going to end because I'm going to kill myself, of course. But, you know, I just felt it was that important to me. Now I say, well, Lord, if you let it happen, it's all right. If you don't, it's all right. Because I still would like companionship. But my prayer is different. You remember I said sometimes you have to pray a different prayer because sometimes the answer is no. Uh, and what, what I've done now is I still have that desire. And I think as long as it's a desire, you can pray it. I mean, who, 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 uh, putting a statute of limitations on your prayer life? Who said you have to have, a, uh, limits on how long you can pray for something? I mean, you know, Anna and, and Simeon prayed for, uh, the coming of, of, of Jesus for years, Anna the prophetess in the temple prayed for years uh, for the consolation of Israel. They waited for it. You know, the Bible says she was a widow from her youth pretty much, but she served in the temple all those years and, and kept praying and kept serving. And, they, and her and Simeon, God let them live to see the consolation of Israel. But what we sometimes do or what people sometimes do is say, well, if God hasn't met your deadline, then you need to stop. I don't necessarily ascribe to that. And the Bible doesn't really teach that. So I think as long as you have the desire, you keep praying. Now, you know, be aware that God has the prerogative to answer in whatever way God sees fit. But if that's a desire, then I would keep praying. I still pray for companionship. 
but I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to stop living my life because I don't have a husband. And I'm not going to let other people make me feel bad because I don't have one. I'm going to live my life like it's golden, you understand? Hallelujah. So I, I, my answer to that is you pray as long as the desire is there. Because there's, first of all, a thousand years is like a day with God. And then the other thing is, you know, some things you is it's about learning to trust God's timing. And then sometimes you may discern that that answer may be no. What I'm saying is, I'm not sure the answer is no yet. Because I'm still alive. And so I figure as long as I'm alive and kicking and ticking, God can answer my prayer or I can meet somebody. But again, it's not, it's not like it used to be. I don't have the same obsession and obsession is really too strong of a word, but I'm not as preoccupied by being single. Why? Because back then, you know, People and folks still try to make you think something wrong with you if you're single and you don't. Know, what's wrong with her? She ain't got no husband. She gay. And that's, that's the first thing they want to say. You know, they didn't even stop talking about that. Now, I guess they got tired of trying to make me gay. But nevertheless, at the end of the day, you know, I was more preoccupied by what people thought about me than I was. And I wanted to be married, but the other pressure was coming from external pressure that somehow, you know, that would reduce suspicion and stop folk from thinking something was wrong with me. I'm a whole person though. So I got my theology right a bit about being single. So now my desire to be married is not because I'm worried about what folks think about me anymore. I, I want to be married because I would like to one day be married because, or I wanted to be married for companionship. That's, a diff that's two different things anyway. Let me shut up because I'm going into a whole nother Bible study. The, at, the, at the end of the day, pray as long as you need to pray. That's that's my counsel because there's no there's no biblical instruction. You know, I've heard people say, you know, if you pray and you ask God and you go back and ask God, you ain't got no faith. Well, the Bible doesn't teach that, and I don't believe that. I don't believe that, and the Bible doesn't teach that. Paul said, for this thing, I asked the Lord three times that he might remove it when he was praying about that thorn. And I don't believe that three is intended to be interpreted literally. I believe that what that meant was that Paul asked repeatedly that God would remove it. And until God gave him an answer, ooh, I'm about to go into a tongue here. He said, my grace is sufficient. And my power is perfected. God gave Paul an answer. But if God hasn't given you an answer, then I would say, keep praying. Peace. Okay, good. I'm glad that answered your question. Anybody else? Because I know I'm over. Question, comments? I would like to say that I'm learning a whole lot from you with these Bible lessons, and I appreciate it. I love you, and God bless you, and keep it coming. Well, thank you. Thank you. Praise the Lord. I'm glad. I'm glad that it's worth the investment. And I'm glad you all keep tuning in. I'm telling you, this is blessing my entire soul to see you all tune in every week. Any, anybody else? Pastor Stewart, I have, yes. um, I love, like, you are being like a big encouragement on half of the stuff that you're saying. Like, I'm, I'm a young person, but I still kind of, have the up and down on what you was just preaching uh about today uh -huh. so that being said it kind of helped me out today because i had like a up a up um thing a situation today about this so you hit every word today on it Crazy. like they didn't want to they didn't want to come to the conclusion on um on half of the stuff that they were doing today nobody had faced up about it so uh -huh. nobody wants to take got, responsibility. Yeah, I had got upset about it real bad. So I had to kind of go to another room and kind of cool off a little bit. But like you said, nobody would never want to fess up about it. And it's kind of it's it's getting kind of um, you know, 
kind of crazy about that, but you kind of hit it on the head today. Like you, you really hit it on the head. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, you know, we live in a culture where lying has become normalized. Right. Um, and where lying is not only normalized, but it's rewarded. I mean, again, that thing that used to be the chief executive is rewarded for lying. I mean, he lies and folk knows, know, know that he's lying. And a lot of the people that support him lie. So yeah. we live in that kind of culture, a culture that normalizes lies, that endorses deception, and where there's really no penalty for some people for deception or lying or throwing other folk under the bus, you know? And so it's, we already have our kind of hardwired for it anyway, is what Dr. Thomas is arguing that Adam and Eve set the pattern up for us to blame other people for, or shift responsibility to other folk. And sometimes it's just easier I mean, it's painful to say, yeah, we dropped the ball on that. But you'll go a lot further if you just go on and own it, you know, rather than trying to throw other people on the bus or make excuses, you know, or trying to give an expert. Just, you know what? I forgot. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. I, I had a lot of stuff on my, whatever the case may be, rather than trying to write a book about why you didn't do because at the end of the day you still didn't do it or at the end of the day you did it and you shouldn't have at the end of the day somebody put their fingers in that potato pie now they, they didn't want to tell the truth but somebody somebody put their all 10 fingers somebody shout 10 fingers all 10 fingers in the potato pie and nobody owned took responsibility this is about taking responsibility and as believers as disciples of Jesus Christ, people are not just looking at us because we say we're believers. They're looking at us as examples too, or models, you know? And when we cannot model the kind of behavior that is reflective of some of the tenets of what it means to be a Christian or a disciple of Jesus Christ, then what do we do? What does that do? It disrepresents, misrepresents Jesus because we're trying to represent Jesus. We're trying to glorify God in everything that we do. We don't want to be known, you know, in spaces as somebody that won't own up to our stuff or take responsibility for what we've done. We can make our environments a whole lot easier if we all just take responsibility for what we do rather than, you know, trying to throw somebody else under the bus or blame somebody else when we know we did it or we didn't do it. Just tell it and, you know, tell it first. Go on and tell it first and then nobody else can tell it. S snitch on, if you will. Anybody else? Pastor. Yes, ma'am. The, um, one thing I noticed about this, I love the subject. I've been loving everything you preach. I'm like her, but I noticed as a preschool teacher, it starts so early. Mm -hmm. Kids, they they shift the blind. I didn't do it. He didn't do it. So the <laughs> one thing that I do in my class, I tell them, tell the truth. It doesn't uh -huh. matter what you think your consequences are going to be, because if you're bad enough to do that, you better be bad enough to own up to it. Yeah. Tell the truth in my classroom. And the most, you know, and it 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 catches on really, really good. I'm proud of my baby. They they'll tell the truth. Yeah. They be scared of what the consequence is gonna be. Right. But most of the time when I tell them, they so afraid of what's gonna happen. But I tell them, right. since you told me the truth, now go over there and apologize and go back to what you're doing because your punishment is gonna be a whole lot worse if you don't tell the truth. That's exactly right. But, yeah. That's so that's it starts early and we have to, you know, we try, we got, as adults, we got to give it to these babies because they're coming up. Uh-huh. Yeah. So I, I love it. Thank you. That's it. Yeah. And, I, and, and you're right. Uh, <clears throat> telling the truth, <laughs> fear keeps us from telling the truth. And, and someone just typed in the chat, Sean just typed in the chat, trauma triggers also keep us from telling the truth 
which is a very valid point because what has happened in the past, truth got us in trouble. Truth led to something that was uncomfortable or truth could have led to pain or it could have led to, you know, abuse or a whole no a number of other things. At the end of the day, fear keeps us from being honest because we are afraid of what the consequences or the penalty will be. If, if you're going to lose your job for telling the truth, you're going to find somebody to throw under the bus. <laughs> if, if, if it means you could be demoted or suspended, you going to, because you don't want you can't afford to lose your job. You can't afford to be suspended, you know, but I think what you are saying to Yolanda, when you say to them, tell the truth, you won't get in trouble. That, that safety that accompanies that is also important as well, because a lot of times our fear is what keeps us from telling the truth. Exactly. That's what and I want them to understand that it's important to tell the truth. Don't be afraid because every time you tell the truth, don't mean you're going to get in trouble. I try to teach, I don't yell at my kids. Uh -huh. well, I'm going to yell at you just because you did something wrong. That's okay. We're entitled to a mistake. We're, we're, we're going to make mistakes. You're going, you're going to hit your friends, but if you hit them, go back and tell them you saw them and tell them you apologize. Right. Which you is know. part of what parenting, you, you, are, you are actually parenting those children because there's more to it than just owning up to it. There mm -hmm. is responsibility yeah. on the other side of the truth telling that needs to take place. And that's what I want them to learn because they're young. And when they get in this world, when they get out there, I want you to be, you look them in the face. I always look them in the face and you speak up and tell what, you, what happened. Right. That's what I teach my babies, Pastor. Yeah. So thank you. Yeah. God got to help all of us. Jimmy's still talking about these pies. Jimmy said, I'd make them confess even at age 65. <laughs> Let it out now. Pastor, All right. Is, uh, I, but somebody else get ready to say something. I just wanted to thank you so much, Pastor. This is Dr. Harris, and I was oh. really encouraged so much by the conversation. I appreciated the uh, Sean's comment about trauma, and I wondered if you could just speak to us a little bit about that in part, because last week we, we ended up on a really powerful note around self-love and self-care and the affirmations of ourselves as true children of God. And that in itself can interrupt trauma patterns. And I do know that victimization can also be a part of the process of coming to voice about the truth. So I, I what, it, what you named tonight was really, really powerful. But I think for those of us who are also moving with people who are moving through trauma or moving mm -hmm. through trauma ourselves, it would be helpful just to hear a little bit more about how, how can we use the word uh, to be able to, to God not give us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. How can we use the word more to break that cycle of victimization as in some cases it is a part of the healing process? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think, as I said earlier, thank you, Dr. Harris, for raising that. And again, let me thank Sean for, for bringing, bringing that to, to light about how trauma can keep us from telling the truth. And and I would also say that it, it becomes a defense mechanism. Uh, and, and these are in extreme cases too. So what, what I'm talking about tonight, I'm, I was really not thinking about trauma when I was talking about confession and throwing people under the bus. I was thinking in general, as it relates to the way we are tempted to, you know, often shift the blame to other people. But there's another side to, um, our resistance to telling the truth because we because there is trauma in our past or trauma in our history that has that impacts our ability to tell the truth and to be honest and i think it still goes back to what i said before that confession brings god's unconditional love and god's forgiveness and my argument that i didn't get to really fully develop tonight is is that this is why we as Protestants must develop and cultivate the discipline of confession. 
And that before it begins with somebody that is a safe person, it also must begin with God. Now, if there's someone that doesn't have that relationship with God, they need a safe space. Again, I go back to what I, I often say, this is why our church has counseling. This is why our church has a Dr. Carter, Dr. Deborah Carter, uh, who does counseling at, at free of charge, at no charge for our church because our experiences are so vast and so wide that we all come from various stages, various places. We've had various experiences. To some degree, all of us have had some type of trauma, I think. I think we we right now we're living in perpetual trauma. I mean, just watching stuff on the news is a form of trauma, all of the killing and stuff that we see. But there are some cases that are more severe than others. But at the end of the day, the trauma, in my opinion, still doesn't give us the right to blame other people who could possibly be innocent. So um, I was looking at a movie the other night. I like watching Law and Order. And there was this guy, this mother, who had buried her son. Her and her husband actually um, buried their son because they accidentally killed him. He failed that they were fighting. They were drunk. This is a, this is a story. This is not a true story. This is a law and order, but this is an example that comes to mind. They were fighting and they ended up knocking the son down the steps and they buried him. I mean, he died. They didn't want to report themselves because they were drinking. So they buried him in the backyard. She ends up going, kidnaps another little boy <laughs> while he was at the park with his sister and raises him as her own son. Well, the plot thickens a little bit because that little boy that she kidnapped ended up getting his car stolen. And no, 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 he didn't get his car stolen. Yeah, he had this little girl. And I don't know what made him go get the little girl. But anyway, he brought the little girl home and laid in the bed with her with no clothes on. When she found him, instead of her turning him in to the police, this is the little boy she kidnapped that grew up to become, um, he didn't do anything to her, but you know, it ain't nothing normal about a grown man laying in the bed with a, with a six-year-old. Instead of her holding him accountable, she tells him to take the little boy back to where he found her. He puts her in the trunk. Somebody steals his car. And the police <laughs> stop the man. The little girl is in the truck. It's a mess. So you get my point. Tra <laughs> trauma triggers a whole lot of drama. <laughs> and it still began with the mother and the father not being willing to take responsibility. That's a long way around, the, uh, a long answer to your question, Dr. Harris. But I see Doc on the call, and Doc is a psychologist on the call, not me. So I'll defer to Dr. Carter and ask Doc to add anything that I may have missed in my response before we before we end this call. Um, I agree with um, everything that you said. Trauma um, does trigger uh, fear in us, depending on the consequences and past experiences and like you said if there have been a lot of abuse or um i run into so many people who have experienced um second sexual abuse and then their parents uh don't believe them and so nothing happens and uh it's abandonment um all kinds of emotions and experiences can cause people not to tell the truth. You won't, you don't believe you're gonna be believed. Um, and so you don't tell the truth. And you don't want to get other people in trouble. Uh, people pleasers. So there's a whole lot to unpack um, with that. So I'll just I'll just add that part there. <laughs> yeah. And 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 uh Dr. Harris asked the question, um, what, what I think she asked something about how do we 
What did you say, Dr. Harris? Yeah, I would thank you for the response. It's really helpful, actually, and I appreciate this. It's uh, how do we use the word? So one the of word. the ways, yeah, the word, and even the scriptures that you gave us tonight, Pastor, are very helpful because no matter if someone is going through trauma or not, there, are, there it seems to be a way to encourage them literally by reading the word with them or encouraging them to read particular scriptures because that in itself can be an indoor to confession. So if you're in the creating the space, a safe space for some time, sometimes you just start with reading the Bible together, a particular word, and you ask for the spirit to be present to illuminate the word. So I appreciate the, the teaching about, about this because it is, I think if we can get fear out the door and bring in the power of Christ, that's the first step to the person themselves opening their heart to communicate with the Lord, that this is what's really going on with my heart. So I appreciate this teaching on confession. Thank you. Yes. And, and it's also um, to add what you said, and, and this really is, you know, these, these after the show <laughs> conversations bless my soul. Uh, I don't know if they help you, but they really bless my soul because we get to the, oftentimes to the meat of some really important issues that people are dealing with. But it's also important, it's also why it's so important to have a relationship with God, that we have a relationship with God that we are developing and nurturing as individuals, that we do not rely on other people uh, or that we do not rely on someone else to stand in proxy, if you will, for our relationship. And so much of that is grounded in knowing that I am loved by God. Again, as I said last week, we have done such a disservice to the body of Christ uh, in terms of the way that we have packaged God, if you will, that the unconditional, unfailing love of God is the baseline. That, that while I am flawed, God's love for me is flawless. And that because God's love for me is flawless, then I can come boldly. I can come with confidence into God's presence and, and begin with, with confession and begin with telling God the truth. And then as I tell God the truth, I can be honest with myself and I can be honest with others. But if I've learned as a life strategy to deflect, to hide, to cover, or whatever the case may be, and I have not found that safe space, then we see, and because we already hardwired for it, it doesn't take much 